can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's start. Um, yeah, as he said, I'm Mariano Garra. Here you can follow me, the, la the website language, the, la the Twitter handle, what I do that pays for this. <laughs> um, so let's start with a quick disclaimer. Um, I will start kind of uh, in a critic mode, uh, but at the end uh, there are proposals for improvements. And I also think that it's quite um, um, useful to have some talks um, that look at the other side of, uh, of the things. Uh, the first time I saw it, it was in the Django conference where they have a specific talk. They invite someone from outside and the title of the talk is Django Sucks. So <laughs> the, the, the idea of the talk is to, to critique what it's not okay and find ways to improve it. Um, so you know, you may know this expression. Erlang had it 25 years ago. Uh, it's a common expression and it's actually true, which is really cool. Erlang made really interesting decisions a long time ago based on problems. And with that, they were like 25 years ahead of um, the competition, let's say. But did how did we evolve after 25 years? It's 2017. Did we evolve like a BMW or that more like a Lada? Um, the problem is, uh, that w when once you get something right, you get more comfortable. Like you say, okay, we have a really powerful platform. People will come because yeah, we we are the cool guys. But let's see the other way around. What things are we doing now today that other communities or other languages will be copying in the next 25 years, which is crazy to think about. But that which things are we doing right now that we will be first in 25 years. So I think the times are changing or they already changed a, a, long, a while ago. There are like 25 years ago or 15 years ago, you had Emacs or VI, of course VI, a makefile and Erlang and you just had everything you needed, nothing more because everything was like that. Like, Tooling our own languages, except for things like Smalltalk, weren't really common. So building tooling and support around around programming languages wasn't really common. And there weren't many choices. Like you got, uh, as Joe Armstrong said once, that you could choose between Fortran, C, and Bash. Like th th those were the choices. But now, comparing it with cars, keep the, the theme. Um, like people have many choices, even many choices that on the basis are pretty similar. For example, these three cars are, are actually the same car, are the same platform from three different big car brands. These, uh, these other three from another brand are the same car. They are actually built in the same factory from three different car brands that are from di three different countries, but their three brands are from actually from the same company, which is Volkswagen. So in, in terms of programming languages, we have this explosion of, of options. Um, many of those are come from a family of languages, which I call algo-like or derivatives from algo. And people have some certain expectation or they are more comfortable with that kind of syntax. And it's not only the language, but also the tooling and the community and the things around the language that make an important part of uh, the choice for, for a language. So as with many things, uh, Pangrog has all the answers. Uh, Dead Kennedys had a, a record called Give Me Convenience or Give Me Death. And uh, what I'm saying with this, this is John McCarthy, you may know it. Know it. Uh, he invented Lisp. Here he is in 1967 um, using an IBM 7660 or something like that programmed with Lisp to play chess. Uh, he wasn't using Lisp and uh, 67 because of the speed. Joe Armstrong, before inventing Erlang, <laughs> said this, like he was using Smalltalk. I will change hands, more comfortable. Uh, he was using Smalltalk and when Smalltalk GC'd, he will go to take a cup of coffee. So he wasn't using Smalltalk because of the speed. This is a quote from DHH, the creator of Ruby on Rails. When he started Ruby on Rails uh, using it in Basecamp, his company, 
he was restarting the server 400 times a day, and after improving it, uh, he was only starting it like 10 times a day. So why all of these choices? Because we can tolerate a lot of pain if the tool make us productive or, or make us feel productive, which may not be the same thing. So McCarthy wasn't using Fortran, Joe wasn't using C, and DHH wasn't using Erlang. So what's that? Because Productivity is not just a thing of the language, of the syntax, or the semantics of the VM, even of the VM implementation. It's the whole experience. It's that's what I call community in this in this talk. So I've observed some things that let's call it Mariano's law if you want. Uh, the effort of the community is inversely proportional to the power of the tool. When you get a powerful tool, there's this feeling that yeah, yeah it's it's much more powerful than the alternative, so let's just sit and wait for people to come. So this is a REPL in Java land, in uh, IntelliJ, I think. Look at all the things they had to do. Like they, they had to build an IDE, they had to build a graphical toolkit, they had to build this all this UI, and they also had to build all the, like the supporting to make a REPL out of Java because Java doesn't have uh, something like a re REPL natively. But after that, they have a quite good REPL and a visual one and auto-completion and all the types and all the annotations. So something that we get, get for granted, they had to make a lot of effort to get. But after they made all of the, the effort, then they, now they have a REPL and much more things than that. The, the ID support, the Java is really cool. And I cannot imagine programming Java without an IDE. So that's, why that's the reason why they have so many cool IDEs. Um, can I? I think it's better if I come here so you can see it. Um, so on the left, we have languages I call the pragmatics, which are languages that take ideas from other languages, which have really good ideas before them. But then they take more shortcuts or hacks. And they, since they are not perfect or pure, they have to make a lot of effort to build things around the language to make them more usable or approachable. So you can see C, Tick from Algo, C, C++, Java from Simula and Smalltalk, Python from ABC, Ruby from Smalltalk, and JavaScript from Self and Scheme. And on the other side, we have languages I call the if we build it, they will come, which they got a lot of things right. They are like, for each category, they are the languages that started that like branch of programming languages. But who is using one of these today? So Guy Steele, uh, he is known from for Scheme, but also he was on the committee standardizing Java. And he said that he was trying to take C++ programmer halfway to Common Lisp through Java. So many people may not be think that this is right, but Java, the good things about Java is that they brought the idea of a virtual machine and GC to the mainstream. So we got people halfway to more powerful languages, even if not to Lisp. And this not only happens with languages. Like on the left, you have like things you know you should be doing, or you know it should be better if we did, like TDD, for example. And on the right, you have convenience. We end usually end up on the right because of convenience, not because it's the right choice. I think we are selling Erlang, and when I say Erlang, the Bean in general, the wrong way. When somebody asks us what's, what's cool about Erlang or why, why should I be using Erlang, we tend to focus on the features of Erlang. Like we say, yeah, like per process GC and cheap processes and 260 something bytes and, and concurrency and schedulers and, and preempty multitasking and stuff like that. But what they are expecting to, to hear is which cool things, how, how Erlang makes them more powerful. Like we're talking about the flower and they want to talk about, they want to, they want us to talk about what the flower allows them to, to do or to be. So um, this is an actual thing. Uh, I was thinking on participating in a hackathon some months ago. And I say that the problem of the hackathon is, or the idea is that you have 24, 48 hours to build some software. So 
And I thought, would I use Erlang? Because I tend to use Erlang for almost everything I do, but the time pressure, or I have to deliver something really quick. And let's call it mean time to meaningful result, which is how much time or how much scaffolding or how many concepts around the thing that I actually want to get do I have to get before I get something meaningful out of it? So for example, the the I think one of the reasons why Ruby and Rails become so uh, important is was because the first thing he did was a YouTube video screencast showing people how to build a blog engine in 15 minutes. So he didn't talk about the features of Ruby or how the VM is implemented or which uh, patterns uh, Ruby and Rails uses or which cool features of the language it uses. He said, look, look, like start, create this project, run it, you have a blog. Like show the result first, then let's talk about how cool Ruby is or how cool Ruby and Rails is. So that's why I think we are selling Ear Erlang the wrong way. We are like talking about the cool features, but we never say to people how much more productive they would be if they used Erlang. So this is uh, by coincidence, by a quote by Jason Fried, the co-founder of Basecamp from uh, the product behind Ruby on Rails. So here's what our product can do. It's different from his what you can do with your product. It sounds similar, but it's not the same thing. So I feel this happens with Erlang. It's the powerful language tarp in which everything is possible, but nothing of interest is easy. Like if I want to hack a quick REST API to test something, how many steps that I could remove are there? And, or if I search on Google how to build a REST API on Erlang, how much uh, accidental complexity is it uh, around the, the problem I want to solve? So I think we should be selling Erlang the opposite way. Th there's a talk by, um, from Rich Hickey, the creator of Clojure, that he talks about the language of the system. In fact, in a part, he mentions Erlang, Erlang as a possible language of the system. The advantage of Erlang is that uh, it's at a higher level of ab abstraction than other languages. It's more like a glue between systems or a language to handle other languages or a language to handle platforms or, s or systems. But also it's really powerful for things like Internet of Things, for of obviously for uh, REST APIs, web stuff, for web sockets, for putting Erlang on in front of other systems and many other things. But it's not just a matter of saying this, wh which we should be saying. When somebody says like, why should I be using Erlang? We should say, because this is the things you can build with Erlang. But we ha also have to create all the libraries and the the documentation, the blog posts, the examples, the GitHub repositories with easy to run examples. It's not just a matter of saying that it's possible, but to show that it's actually easy to achieve. And we have to be careful with this problem, which is called the innovator's dilemma, which is like Erlang is innovating in many things, but more pragmat pragmatic languages, and you may have seen it, are getting ideas out of Erlang and implementing them, not the best way but uh, possible, but the way they can. So you see things like Akka, Akka.net, Orleans on the .NET, uh, Go, Golang the language. So if we don't move and keep improving, uh, we may get to a point where other languages and platforms copy enough features of the Erlang VM, uh, and at that point there won't be a big enough reason to switch to Erlang be because the other languages are good enough at the things that Erlang is good at. You may be thinking that I don't see a problem. Like This conference is really cool, many people and many people doing interesting stuff, but that's called survivorship bias. <laughs> like th In the Second World War, um, the English started analyzing the planes that came back from from the missions to Europe to see where, where they were hit and to see where, where they should put more like uh, more material to avoid the plane from actually crashing. So the, the first thing you may think is, okay, if they get hit there, then let's put more re reinforcements there. No, actually, you have to put reinforcement on the places where no hits are. 
because these planes got hit on those places and came back. That means that the ones that didn't came back were hit on the places and the empty spots. So if I ask you, like, um, is Erlang hard? Or do you think that there's something wrong with Erlang? Or is it hard to start with Erlang? Or you are the ones that survived. So for some reason, <laughs> we, are, we have uh, some genetic difference where we can survive all of these challenges. We have to go out and talk with people that tried Erlang and for some reason didn't continue using it or decided for something else. A quick easy way is whenever you read um, something on Hacker News already that says this is a new service built on Golang and you say oh, this should be built in Erlang, right? Every time you read that, you should take it as a reason to make more efforts to make that the next time somebody implements a service that should be written in Erlang is actually written in Erlang. Or, well, when you see it's some like distributed system built on top of Node.js or something like that, you say, oh God, that this should be running on the Erlang VM. But for some reason, it's not running there. So why should you care? Because you, you already are working on Erlang, you're programming on your day job, why should you care? Let's do a bus factor exercise. These people are really influential in the community. What would happen if we didn't have them? How many things we wouldn't have? How many talks, how many libraries, how many frameworks, how many books and stuff like that? But let's go the other way around. What would happen if we had twice of these kind of people? Five times these kind of people, 10 times these kind of people? So at least let's do it for the egotistical reasons. So if you want to have more libraries, more books, more blog posts, more companies using Erlang so you can choose where you want to go to work next and stuff like that. You just do it for the ego for that egotistical reason. Let's try to make it easy to and to be a bigger community on Erlang just so that you can benefit personally. So here is some low hanging fruit. Um, this is the Erlang website, which is it's nice looking, but I, I find some problems with it. So let's say I'm not an Erlang programmer, and I go to Erlang.org, and I read build massively scalable soft real-time systems, and I'm at uh, the hackathon. Um, that's not what I'm looking for. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't say, be saying that. But let's read, let's continue. So Erlang is a programming language used to build massively scalable soft real-time system. So it doesn't apply to me. I'm building a website uh, with requirements on high availability. Yeah, that's uh, nice to have. Some of its uses are on telecoms. I'm not a telecom. Banking, e-commerce, computer telephony, instant messaging. The closest I would get there is instant messaging, maybe. So, and I quick, I say, okay, let's keep going. I don't see anything about webs or web sockets or HTTP2 or MQTT or Internet of Things, but let's keep going. Let's go to the quick start. Maybe you see better there. Then you say, okay, I, I want to see this experience of let's make a blog engine in 15 minutes. But it starts with like a really slow introduction of every single thing that Erlang has. And at the end, like after like six, seven, eight chapters, you're on, on the if statement. Like, I mean, this, this documentation is useful and it has to be there, but this is not a quick start. This is our reference manual or something like that. Let's compare, I, I, I'm not comparing it with JavaScript. Let's compare it with Haskell. So really nice website, I have to say. Nice tagline, a little mode of tagline or explanation. A cool code snippet so I can get a feel of like what the language looks like. And they are not using Fibonacci, which is a plus. They have a repo right there on the website. You can start writing Haskell right there. And if you don't know what to write, they have a five minute tutorial on the landing page. So you don't have even to install R Haskell to start. So <laughs> yeah, and then you have videos and then you have books and then you have tutorials and blog posts and feeds and everything. And I'm comparing Erlang to a language whose motto is avoid success at all costs. So <laughs> it's like all down from there. <laughs> And you can check the Elm website, the Okamu website, the Racket, web, uh, Racket website. Those are like hardcore languages and all the websites are much more approachable. They, you can get a sense of the language and what you can do with the language much faster. You have quick starts, good getting start guides, 
instructions on how to install it. Even you can run it without installing it. They have all tri uh, web online repos. I'm not comparing it with like mainstream languages even. I'm comparing with, with hardcore stuff. So this was the complaining part of the talk. I will move here again. <coughs> so what I'm doing. Um, first, I started trying to improve the documentation. I opened a P uh, pull request say seven months ago, and I blogged a how-to guide on how to work with the build system and how to get the documentation built and which files you have to go and check and change to get improvements on the doc so other people can go and keep going from my guide. It got merged. I think it should be available in the next release on 20. Um, I'm building a tool to create a client-side index for search, not only for the like for the, for Erlang itself, like Erl docs, but without the backend, um, but also for your tools. My idea is to open a pull request where on their official Erlang documentation, you can hit an icon on the top right or do control S or something, and you can start typing, and as you type, you get um, all the parts of the documentation that match your search, and then you click and you go to that part of the documentation. Because a crazy thing about the Erlang documentation is that there's a lot of documentation, really detailed, good documentation, but the structure is not really approachable, so a good search um, will make it much easier. I'm also working on a tool to convert from the XML to restructured te text, and uh, from there, I can use things to build a website, which is the tool that Read the Docs website uses. But it's not only to convert to restructured text, it's a generic platform to get from XML to X, which the first ones will be plain text, for, for, for example, for quick tools to when you hover over a function, you get the documentation of that function. It can be also markdown, as they mentioned today. And this tool is called Beamdocs. Um, and I, I will do a lightning talk to speak to all the other people that I would like to get some help here so we can get this. So this is the, the, the PR that got merged. It's not a lot. I, I didn't try to do a lot uh, in the first PR because I wanted to first learn how to use it and see if they would accept uh, the pull request. And they did. So it's a simple, slightly improvement of, of styling, and now we have optional syntax highlighting on the code, which is useful. Um, this is how the docs look after being compared to restructured text and built with Sphinx. Uh, so we get a, if you have used read the doc or something like that, um, it, this is, we can use a tool that many communities use so we can build on the shoulders of giants in that sense. And I'm also doing a thing called the FNM for a long, long time, but I decided that it was time to release it to the public. So what's FNA? It's more of an attitude towards community, documentation, tooling, and user experience, and it happens to be also an alternative syntax for Erlang. It's just that. It's not much more than that. Uh, I'm not trying to build specific tools or specific libraries or everything. It's just another way of writing Erlang and interacting with the ecosystem. So you may know what this is. It looks like JSON, right? Well, that's the FNS syntax for data with the extra of you can have uh, trailing commas everywhere. Um, and uh, the rest, you can have atoms. Whoops, I know what to click. If you have an atom with some crazy characters, you can use backticks because I use the single quotes for binary strings, which I write more, much more binary strings than crazy atoms. And uh, this is the cons operator. Um, I think it's much more clean than the current syntax. These are tuples like Python. Um, so now you know everything there is to know about the syntax for data on, on FN. This is a binary pattern that matches uh, the uh, IPv4 packet, I think. Uh, it's just a map with a tag that says this is a binary. So the syntax for binary pattern matching is just the syntax for maps. You don't have to learn a new syntax. If you want to add more parameters, um, instead of putting a number there, you put a map with the options. Um, 
this is the syntax for, yeah, if you code on C, JavaScript, Python, this is the syntax for operators. This is the syntax for uh, binary operators, same. And booleans are taken from Python. Uh, comparison from Python, yeah, or any, yeah, Python. Um, so let's see a little bit more syntax. Um, this is the match, which in Erlang is case of. Um, at the core of Erlang, if you didn't notice, is basically case clauses, what they are called in the compiler, and which is match this, then do that. So this is a case clause that matches error and a variable and returns it. This is the a guard and uh, else, if you want to match something else. This is a receive. I don't know if you notice. This is how you receive. This is a top level function. This is a public top level function. This is a lambda. This is a name lambda. This is list map. This is, if I had a module that had the lambda first and not last, if you know closure, this is called threading. I couldn't make try align with all the other ones, but it's the same thing. <laughs> You can see it there. This is a try catch. And threading the other way, um, like if you want to thread to the end of this next call, you use the double thread. If you want to thread first, you thread it like that. Um, this is a list comprehension slash for loop. Like functional, hardcore functional programmers will hate me for this, but uh, there is a cool optimization in Erlang. If the compiler knows that you are doing a list comprehension only for the side effects, that is, you're not assigning to anything, it won't build the list of the last element. Uh, so what this allows is to have more than one statement here and use it for side effects or for a list comprehension, which is this replaces many of the cases where you use list map and uh, list for each. This is uh, for each, for with a clause. This is uh, four with two generators. This is one of the main problem with Erlang. It's really small and really subtle, but Erlang doesn't have an if statement, but it has the if keyword. So when people see the if, they think, oh, it's an if statement. I, well, I, know, I know what it is, and it doesn't work that way. That's because if in Erlang is not an if, it's a guard, and guards need to be executed uh, fast because they are everywhere and they are at the head of the function clauses so they cannot have any call there. They only have some, some functions you can call there. So let's not use if for something that it's not an if and let's use the same keyword I use on guards, which is when. So when people see when, we say when is just a guard that matches that it's there, it's not uh, attached to any other clause. These are records, uh, uh, of course they are supported. Um, this is how to declare it at the top level. And I use here again the tagged uh, data. Uh, tagging data is uh, compiler plugins. W I ship FN with, the, with compiler plugins for binaries and for records. Uh, you can add your own tag data, it, I make it hard enough so that you don't ship everything with your specific uh, tagged uh, plugins, but if you if we decide that some other extension is useful, uh, I will add it, or you can load it as a dependency. So you create a record with the map syntax, uh, with r dot and the name of the, of the record. Uh, you match with the map syntax. You get a field like this, you update it like this, and you get the index of the field like this. So it's all, there's no specific syntax for that. Um, since it's an alternative syntax for Erlang, uh, we support the dialyzer, xref, and whatever, Elvis, or whatever works with Erlang. So you can write your types, you can write your spec, you can attach any kind of metadata to functions, and then you can retrieve that metadata for a function. You can say, give me all the attributes for this function, and and so we use it to declare public, uh, so you don't have to, have to export it at the top. You can if you want, but you just mark it with public, and, and it's exported. You can define the spec. So Erlang FN is, as I said many times already, 
just an alternative syntax for, for Erlang. There is not going to be any specific tool for FN. There's not going to be, it doesn't have a standard library. It's not going to have wrappers around Erlang libraries. It's not got going to have implementations of things that already exist on Erlang. It maps one to one to Erlang. It, you can use xref, dial IRC. You get all the Erlang warnings because I'm just an alternative syntax. Uh, it can compile to bytecode. It can transpile one to one to Erlang. I'm not generating any extra, like, uh, like every expression in FN is the same thing in Erlang except the threading, which I will put the call in the place where it should go. So if you compile to Erlang, you will have nested calls. Um, other cool features, uh, you can include Erlang uh, headers. Uh, you can use macros, you can include an Erlang macro and use it in FN, which uh, may not sound interesting, but given the fact that uh, Erlang macros are lexical, <laughs> it wasn't that easy. Um, th there's nothing to install. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to add two lines of rebar conf config. I ask, uh, uh, Third, if it could be just one, and he, he gave me a reason why it cannot be just one line, but it's just two lines. You can start with one file. So you have a project, you add these two lines to rebar config, and you start with one module in, in Erlang. If you don't like it, you can bail out at any time. You do rebar, three FN, and compile, format Erlang, and it will generate Erlang for all the, your FN files. The only other extra feature, other than threading, is um, when you include a uh, uh, FN file, an FN module, it will include the, the functions. And if you redefine the function in your mo own module, uh, it will override the one on the on the header. Uh, it will give you a warning if you don't specify the override attributes, much more like uh, Java. So it will work, but it will say, look, you have this function in the header and you ha have an implementation and you're m not marking as override, it may be a, an error. What this allows is, uh, for example, if you are doing uh, Cowboy and you have REST handlers, and for almost all your REST APIs, you have many callbacks that are the same. You can just include headers with those functions, and in the specific cases where you need to override one of those, you just override it in place. So in a sense, FN is a boring language. Uh, it, it's probably going to be the last release. Uh, unless Erlang gets a new syntax, in which case we will get a new syntax. Unless we can do it with tag data, which in which case we won't. It doesn't have a standard library, as I said, but it has, as uh, the Python sense says, there should be one way of doing things. So um, the idea on FN, as I said, is an approach to community, to documentation, to tooling, and to onboarding and user experience. So there are, there are something that we I call uh, blessed libraries. So for every thing, single thing you may want to do in FN, there's one recommended library or tool that we recommend. So Cowboy is one, I, I think I have listed them, but the templates will assume that you will use that one and uh, the documentation will specify how to do it with that one. And we will make sure that all the blessed libraries interoperate the right way, then we make it easy to work together, we will work to make documentation better on those libraries so that uh, you get a better uh, experience using them. It won't have wrappers or FN ports of libraries. I, it won't have FN only tools. If a, a tool is built for FN, it should work for Erlang too. And I don't even plan to have a Slack. I will kindly ask the Erlang guys to open a channel on the Erlanger Slack, if they can. So as I said, it's a boring language, but it's also an exciting language. But because the language is done, let's get things done. Let's start working on the other things that Erlang doesn't solve already, or doesn't solve 100% perfectly. So. Let's focus on documentation, on onboarding, on templates, on error messages, on community, on examples, on tools. Uh, let's build this standard stack and let's fill the, the missing pieces. Uh, let's polish and integrate them. The tools, uh, one, some of the tools I'm, I recommend, Rebar3, Relax, Cuttlefish, Cowboy, Lager, Exometer, Recon, Scene, Shotgun, Katana, Worker Pool, Common Test. Um, let's make 
the Beam a better platform for interoperating with other languages. Erlang is great at many things, but it has some parts where it's not good. So let's interoperate with other languages that do that part well. Uh, we should start working on making it easy to write C notes and ifs in Rust because it's less likely that you will get uh, a segmentation fault which will crash your VM if you're using ifs. And also, Rust is much more approachable and user-friendly than C. Uh, let's make it work better with Clojure and JVM in general. We, are, we already have the J interface, so it's just a matter of writing documentation and blog posts on how to use it. Erlang is not a language for building websites, so just backends. So let's interoperate with JavaScript. When we write something, let's show how, how you would use a JavaScript library to talk to Erlang and stuff like that. Now we have uh, GraphQL and stuff like that. Let's, let's show examples of the whole stack, not until the point where we care, and let's, you just write the JavaScript. Let, let's show how it's done. And I think that's, that's a great opportunity of using WebAssembly, which has been standardized and the first version is already available to write um, secure and performant code that uh, won't crash, and it's cross-platform. So uh, there, I have many ideas, we can talk later, on how to make it easy to make calls to WebAssembly to write performance-sensitive stuff uh, in a secure way and cross-platform way. And we will be writing on top of all the browsers. They will be like making it work fast and good and secure, and we can just use it. But also, let's work on system interoperation, interoperability. Let's write and, and try it with Docker, with Rocket, with Kubernetes. Let's write guides and tools to make it easy to deploy to Heroku, Google, Amazon Web Service, Azure. And let's make it easy to use on Windows. We are many Unix guys. I've tried to run my stuff on Windows, and it's not the most pleasant experience. And it's really easy to steal programmers from Windows because many platforms take Windows as a second platform, as a second level platform. So if we are really easy to set up and run on Windows, we will be getting the low hanging fruit of people. If they try to install three uh, platforms and Erlang is the easiest one, they may use Erlang. So which is the status? Um, I'm releasing the 1.0 beta one today. It's been stable for a long time, but I didn't have a reason to release it. <laughs> um, I've been using it for tools. These documentation tools I mentioned before are um, made with FNet. I have some tools to inspect Erlang code, also will build with it. Uh, I have some load testing stuff, and also the backend, I put my hands or my code where my mouth is. So the back end of uh, my new product is built with FNA. So if FNA has a bug, I will know first. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that, that's a way of um, ensuring that I will want to make this a stable release and useful because I'm using it every day. So how can you help? Try FNA, read the docs, open issues. When Whenever you find something confusing, it's not your fault. It's my fault. So report it, I will fix it. Talk about your experience, blog, uh, tweets, or whatever, Mastodon, however it's called, to post something there. Help me with syntax highlighter. Uh, uh, I have one for Beam, but uh, I understand that uh, people don't use Beam because they like. Uh, but Beam and Emacs will be a good place for this community, but I want to make uh, Visual Studio Code the IDE to use. So whenever someone comes and what should be using for FNA, Visual Studio Code. Not because I use it, not because it's cool or something, but because it's, it works, it's easy to install, it has a big community, uh, and it will grow much more useful. So uh, help me improve the pretty printer, uh, help me improve the REPL. Uh, I'm, I started uh, something called uh, the language server. It's a specification of an open standard that Microsoft released on how to expose a service so that IDEs can interoperate with language tools without having to like do one-to-one -one uh, connections. Uh, templates, so River3, uh, Re new FNA blog, and you get a full blog running and you can play with it. Let me have write templates, I already have some, but I want to write more. And let's build great Beam tooling with FNA. If you are not sure to use it for your work, let's like turn the other side and say, which tools are missing on the Beam ecosystem? Let's build them with FNA so you can try it and we can say that we are coding FNA for useful things. So yeah, help me. 
things. And by the way, remember the LADA uh, image from the beginning? That's the next LADA car. So they went from straight the same thing for 25 years to this new car. So if LADA can change, we can change too. Thank you. So I think we like, have three minutes for questions. OK, can you shout? <laughs> I'm I'm not in the in the mailing list, so uh, I don't know. But uh, I don't I didn't see it. But y y I I've been changing. If you see the PR, I I forgot to link it. I've been changing the Excel XSLT uh, to generate better HTML and stuff like that. And I kind of get it how it works. My idea is uh, to build a tool that will take the XML and generate other formats. So the XML. It's okay, so you, it's easy to process, and let's build tools to generate like different formats from there. Mm. Oh, cool. But what I did, which it's more approachable for Erlang people, is um, I use XMARL to parse the XML and generate Erlang data structures, and then like a walker, and then you can plug in different places and emit something else. So to if someone wants to make a XML to man page, they can write Erlang instead of uh, XSLT, which is it's a good language, but you have to learn it. And it's not the language everybody here knows. So it's a good way. Uh, but I think if if we make it easy for people to to help us, which would be if we provided uh, Erlang tools to build it, I think we we will get a better <laughs> result more easily. Because I even use XSLT before and I forgot almost everything. So yeah, <laughs> but that's that's what I say in this talk. If it's horrible, let's fix it. And if if we say instead of writing XSLT, you can write Erlang to generate other formats, it will be much easier for people to contribute. So that's what I'm trying to, to do. Okay, well, one more thing. Other things you can do is, why cannot we get the elix cool elixir things on the beam? We should start talking about how to get the, the minimum feature to get stuff like protocols on the beam. Why cannot we have an interoperable way of protocols if one of the language already has it? We should pro be providing one-to-one -one mentoring. You should be blogging more. I should be blogging more. We can have stuff like Erlang module of the week. Uh, I would like to see closure documentation, like, li like documentation like in closure, where every single function has examples of usage and comments of like gotchas and stuff like that. Uh, you should follow Erlang on all the platforms, and whenever somebody posts that, be, give meaningful and helpful replies and friendly replies, help people. We should have guides for all the common tasks. Uh, we may be one of the only communities that doesn't have an annual sur survey. I th I th if they have, I, I never got the email. Uh, well, I guess in R20 they are doing this, but the, we always say that Erlang is not good at strings. Can we make it better? I mean, I, it shouldn't be like the best language for string processing, but can we add more functions and make it easier and document the gotchas and guides on how to do string stuff and more? I have more ideas. You can talk to me. I will be tomorrow here. Thank you. <laughs>